I don't think the angry women have found the video I posted yesterday yet. I want them to and I don't want them to at the same time. They need to hear it, but also, yikes. Welcome back to Far From Eden. It's good to see you guys here. And we are going to conclude the reading the article that we started on yesterday's video. The article is entitled, A Feminist Society Drowning in Self-Love and Perhaps a Better Way. And it is by Laura Dill. Um, she goes by at Lorita Dill on Instagram and other places like that. So if you're looking for her work, that would be a way to find it. It took me forever to find out what her name actually is because I couldn't find Lorita Dill. It must be a nickname. It was Laura Dill. Anyway, just to recap, if you haven't seen um, yesterday's, you can totally watch today's and then go back and watch yesterday's. Uh, I found Laura Dill by reading The Transformed Wife, otherwise known as Lori Alexander, who teaches biblical womanhood. I have learned a lot from Lori Alexander. I'm excited that her name is now coming out into the so-called manosphere, red pill area, this sort of, you know, dialogue. I think it's a very important part of all of this. I think it's the keystone to all of this because I think it's where we went wrong, really. That's why the channel's called Far From Eden because it happened then. Think about it this way. As I've said before, Garden of Eden was perfect. God made everything, everything was there. There's nothing more you could possibly want. All the bad stuff wasn't there and it wasn't good enough for Eve. If God can't make something good enough for Eve, neither can a man. And Adam didn't get in trouble for eating the fruit. He got in trouble for listening to his wife because the order is God, man, woman, child. And when Adam listened to the woman, it went God, woman, man, child. There were no children yet, but you get what I'm saying. The moral of that story is you mess up the order, things go awry. And here we are. So. That's just like a brief in case you didn't see last video, in case this is the first Far From Eden video that you're watching. That's like a quick, the quickest kind of recap I can, I can give, I think. Uh, anyway, so we continue. All right. I hope not to have angered anyone through these opinions of mine. I need to clarify that none of what I have mentioned are by any means salvation wickets that need to be hit. One is not saved by being a stay-at-home mother or by submitting to her husband. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But movements and ideals have consequences. There are ways to cultivate a flourishing society, and there are ways to destroy one. And adhering to the very foolish and unwise ideal of feminism has proven to only lead to detrimental consequences, negativity affecting babies, children, families, and society as a whole. Boom, right? Boom. Yeah, I mean, she's... I love this article so much. I love this woman so much. Everything she's saying, absolutely true. I don't know how old she is from her pictures and the, and the age of her child. I would say she's probably 30. She may be younger. She's married. I, like I said before, I don't know what she knows about the family court system or the rest of it. I don't, under, I don't know if she's aware of all the rest of the things that make up the predicament we're in but she certainly gets this and that is refreshing and encouraging. It's encouraging to me. Um, I'm not saying like, go out there and try to find one of them. I mean, sure, if that's, if that's where you, you want to go, good luck. But also I'm very, very wary for the men out there and, and the risks. So anyway, nor am I saying that women in the workforce are all sinning. Because earlier in yesterday's beginning, 
because she's kind of going back and like, I understand how you feel like you need to say these things because this is what women will come back with. Like, you're condemning me, you're judging me, you're this, you're that, and the other. It's like, that is not what I am doing. But that's a great way to try to shut me up. So I understand why she has to come back and feel like she needs to qualify it. And I'm not against it because it, it, it's a good way to shut them up when they try to tell you you're just judgmental. Nor am I saying that all women in the workforce are all sinning or all have mal intentions. I understand some women have to work. However, I truly believe far fewer women really have to work than is argued. True story. Beloved Baptist minister Paul Washer shamelessly observes, why on earth do most people have children? The moment the child is born, they're put in daycare because both parents are working. Why? In some cases, it's to make ends meet for a while, and I can understand that. But in most cases, it's not. Don't lie to me. We're in America. In most cases, it's simply because everybody wants two new cars, a home they can't afford, and a dress with clothes that have certain emblems on them. This is the raw truth. I concur. Absolutely. People don't want to do without, especially women. It's all about keeping up with the Joneses, having a new car. I, I, I cannot tell you the freedom that comes with driving a car that you have no payment, you paid under $1,000 cash for, is 21 years old, wait, 23 years old. Math is a challenge. 23 years old. And I'm like, I'm not worried about the tiniest little scratch. I'm not worried, I'm not worried about a giant scratch, you know? And I probably value my car more than most people, most women do on the street. And I'm like, you don't need all that. Very glad I wasn't raised to think that material things are where it all is. So she says, this is the raw truth. Americans have been brainwashed into a materialistic way of thinking and have lost the art of living simply, enjoying each other and creation over things. Socrates, though off on many things, was right when he said, the secret to happiness is not found in seeking more, but in developing the capacity to enjoy less. This echoes the Apostle Paul's encouragement to Timothy when he wrote, but if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. 1 Timothy 6, 8. Sadly, many women are in denial of what is honestly needed to provide a healthy home for their children, and so they insist upon their need to work to provide a fulfilling home, trading essential quality time for materialistic gain. I don't like the term quality time. All the time with your family is quality. All of it, all of it, all of it. Time with the family. Now, when the dad's off working, shouldn't get mad at him. Shouldn't be like, he's away from the family. He is with the family when he's at work. You know why? Because he is working for them. He's not doing it because he loves it. He's not doing it because it's his fulfillment, whatever. He is doing it thinking of his family all day long. Monotonous things, you know, all, all like that is why he's doing it. So it's hilarious when the women are like jealous that he gets to work. But we covered that in yesterday's video. Oh, and the other thing I was going to say about the people, what Socrates said about developing the capacity to enjoy less. Developing the capacity to enjoy less rests on being grateful. Finding joy and being grateful for things that a lot of people take for granted, especially in this day and age. Seriously, what the sunrise looks like, what the breeze feels like against your skin, the simplest things, the taste of chocolate, which I will be enjoying later. It's, we don't, we don't stop. And a lot of people would hear me say this and roll their eyes at me. I know about this stuff. This is how I survive multiple sclerosis, is being grateful for stuff that other people take for granted. And that is the key to finding joy and contentment. And women are not grateful nowadays. She goes on. 
And again, I am not denying the good that has come from some scenarios of women working. <clears throat> I'm skeptical on this one. God is a gracious God. He makes good come from even evil scenarios. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Let alone from simply unwise choices that we make. To reiterate, I am not implying that working women are evil. I am insisting that it is unwise and unhealthy for society at large. I would say it's evil to abandon your children. That's what I would say. I would say it's evil to put them in daycare. When they say we had to work, mm, did you? Did you? Show me your books. So yeah, I'll, go, I'll say it. I'll say it, but I'm older than this lady. Yeah, I'll say it's evil. And I was left in daycare. I am assisting that is unwise and unhealthy for society at large. But of course, people always want to focus on the exceptions. I know an excellent female teacher, nurse, etc. So do I. But I, number one, strongly believe that parents should educate their own children, in which case teachers wouldn't be needed. For specialized studies, as they get older, male instructors would do just fine. Excuse me. Male instructors do just fine. Actually, they do better at all ages. The education system, which I've never been pro a, you know, a, a national education system, a public government education system for children. They don't have your child's best interest. You do. They don't. What is their best interest? Their interest. Shocking. Is it any wonder that when I was tutoring um, a little girl a few years ago, 2019 or such, I saw um, BCE and I was like, what, what is BCE? Because it was supposed to be BC. She said, oh, before Common Era and then CE is Common Era. And I'm like, um, it's supposed to be AD Anno Domini and uh, Anno Domini and before Christ. And she was a little girl who was a Christian, had been baptized and stuff, and she didn't know that. And her parents didn't know that they changed it. And I told the little girl, this is to hide God. That's what they're doing because this is government pays for these schools. If God exists, then, then they're not the end all be all. So I hope it's stuck. We'll see. She's living in a very liberal area of the nation. I shouldn't say liberal, very leftist area of the nation with uh, leftist parents. So, yeah, so, yeah, she doesn't think they're evil. Parents should educate their own children, in which case teachers, oh yeah, the male teachers. Yeah, male teachers would do just fine. Male teachers do way better. They did way better before females took over the public education system. That's where I was going with that. I'm so sorry, you guys. I get so passionate about this topic. But this argument requires an entire article of its own in which there is not space for here. I get it. <laughs> yes, I know a few nurses who have hearts of gold and tend lovingly to their patients with no ulterior motive other than to help society. This is rare. I know even more nurses who come home and complain about their job, complain about their patients, have zero energy left to interact with their children, and are now more interested in going on a date with the hot doctor they work with married or not. We've all seen Grey's Anatomy, right? Ask any nurse and if she's honest, she'll tell you there is more truth to that show than fiction. And I have heard the same, that that's all it is. That the nurses are a buffet for doctors. I was like, oh my God. Like, so yeah, Grey's Anatomy, there's a reason they had it like that. Um, Cause they were showing the truth, crazy. Anyway, yeah, I've heard some things. The other thing that's interesting about nurses in particular and, and all healthcare, uh, particularly they did a study on female healthcare workers and their, um, their fertility levels, their miscarriages, it, it's off the charts. And it's by, I mean, the CDC, it's right there, but nobody looks at it. And they know that. They know nobody looks at it. Plain sight. 
the detriments of women in the workforce, no matter the occupation, are weightier than the benefits that they may, might produce for society. Children need their mothers at home. Husbands need their wives at home. When this is attacked, it opens the door to all kinds of mischief and malice. For this very reason, Paul writes, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. That's 1 Timothy 5.14. For sadly, it is true that we are prone to meddling and promiscuity if we stray from the wisdom of God's counsel. Also, that's a very good reason for a woman to marry young. I won't say any age that I might think because I am not going to get in trouble with the world. But women should marry young and there should be no gap between father's house and husband's house because in that gap, that's where the adversary starts speaking. That's the, that's the sort of walk around the garden where the serpent, you know, was able to infiltrate and you can't have that. And that's why nowadays, not only is there a gap, but now it's like, oh, you have to go to college. You have to get your career going. That gap between father's house, which who has a dad or a father? Some people have dads, but nobody has a father nowadays. And then to husband, all kinds of serpents are talking to her in there. And that's when you get, as, as Laura says here, meddling and promiscuity if we stray from the wisdom of God's counsel. That's straying from, from God's order and God's, God's instruction for our lives. Indeed, we will be pro, prone to the end of a sad, solitary life. Yeah. Consider my grandma, married to my loving grandpa, with whom together they made four beautiful daughters. My grandpa worked hard so my grandma could stay home and raise their girls. He was a good man, faithful, humble, loving. Yet all the feminist media in the 60s and 70s insisted upon my grandma that she wasn't living up to her true potential. Being just a stay-at-home mother was demeaning and belittling to her. So what did she do? She took up college courses to become a teacher. She somehow believed that teaching other children would give her more value than teaching her own. So she told her four daughters to leave her alone every evening while she studied for her BA and then her MA. For anybody who's not familiar, Bachelor's of Arts and then Master's of Arts. So that's four years for a Bachelor's of Arts and then generally two more years for the Master's of Arts, which you would need to be a teacher. She graduated, became a French and English teacher. No longer was she financially dependent on my grandpa, left him with a broken heart, remained independent and single the rest of her life. Independent. Yeah, I wonder. And died alone. I'm sorry, but ask me if I'm sad about that. I don't, I, I probably should be. Is that admirable? Is that what you'd call success? Maybe if she had listened to the wisdom of J.R. Miller, or better yet, the wisdom of scripture, my mom's childhood memories wouldn't be filled with her mother sitting at the dining room table telling her to go away so she could study, or witnessing her father pack and move out with tears in his eyes because his wife no longer needed him. Maybe my grandma could have died in the arms of her loving husband with whom she built a lifelong home together with instead of alone and bitter. That woman was never a wife. That grandma, she was never a wife because a wife doesn't do that. She was a feminist in disguise and went whoop. That's why it's so dangerous to get married. Cause look, if they can get grandma, you know. Ooh, I'm fired up. I don't like this. It's so sad about this story, but it sounds like the mom witnessed this it sounds like laura's mom witnessed this and was like i don't like it she saw the mother how the mother treated the father and then taught this to laura and look how laura is and honestly i saw how my mother treated my father too and i thought i don't want to be like that i don't want to do this i love my mother she has passed away it was easier to see all this after she died still love her 
but I understand what it all is now. And that's a big reason why I'm here. And now I understand a big way that Laura would have gotten to the conclusions that she got to and why she values her husband so much because she was taught that she was taught this, how wrong this was. I'm gonna reread this, this sentence. Maybe my grandma could have died in the arms of her loving husband with whom she built a lifelong home together with instead of alone and bitter. For she did indeed become bitter at the world. Or she was bitter at herself. Or was she bitter at herself? It is all tragic. It is all too common. And it is all because of the faulty feminist belief that women are more empowered and therefore better off and happier when they are free and independent of men. Yeah, it's a lie. It is a lie. And that's the thing. As awful as it is what it does to the men, these women, they're not, it's not working out for them. It's going to be worse for the women, as bad as it is for the men right now. Because they're feeling the brunt first in a lot of ways. A lot of the earlier women who did this kind of stuff, they had alimony and these women nowadays that are making these decisions to ditch the husbands or never be married or never have children, oh, ho, ho, it's gonna be ugly. It's gonna get ugly for them. It is. Mm. But not all stories have to end this way. And thankfully, I have redemptive stories as well. A columnist responding to G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton in an article titled Career Women writes, today, the feminist view is starting to fade. More and more women are discovering that real happiness and personal fulfillment are not to be found in the factory or office, and that few jobs offer beatitude, but rather boredom, drudgery, and stress. Something men have known this whole entire time. Women are saying in even greater numbers that they want marriage and family and that they want to devote full time to it. Those who have to keep working wish it were otherwise, and I can attest to this, she says. A dear, dear friend of mine asked to come to my house a few months ago to share with me something that has brought her much joy. We have been friends for over a decade. She is married with two children. I have known her to have a feminist mindset the majority of not, the majority if not all of our friendship. That was a typo. She was not always the nicest to her husband, and she often felt undervalued being merely a stay-at-home mother. At one point, she thought it a good idea to boost her self-esteem, there's the word again, by becoming a nanny to watch another woman's children two days a week. It's ridiculous, what the? Calm down, calm down. Somehow leaving her own two children with her parents so that she could take care of someone else's two children so that that mother could hide herself in her office and do paperwork interrupted, uninterrupted would bring her more value and worth due to a small paycheck than staying with her own two children those two days a week. I found this silly, of course, but nevertheless, I loved my friend. She came over for her requested and I couldn't deny the happiness I saw in her spirit. Sometimes I'm not sure how she's wording things, but if that made sense to you guys, good. I was anxious for our little ones to quiet and calm down so she could tell me her news. Well, her news was simply this. She began going to church about nine months prior. She began to realize her worth in Christ and how she didn't need to attain or prove her worth outside of her home. She realized the greatest gift she could ever give to her family was to be home with them, to raise her children herself, and to lovingly submit to her husband. Yes. She began doing all these things, and she said with tears in her eyes that she's never had more peace and joy in her entire life. The warmth that this has created in her marriage and in her home in general has left her in awe. I was so happy for my friend. Yet I cannot forget the words she said to me toward the end. Laura, why didn't you tell me? In all honesty, I thought I had told her. 
I know I've had conversations with her about the love and grace of God, of the beauty of the gospel, and even of the preciousness of motherhood. But what she meant was, I didn't keep telling her. It's so easy to not want to be overbearing, to not want to turn people away or lose friendships. And so after maybe one or two times of having these discussions, I thought, well, that's enough. But to her, that was not being loving. That was leaving her in depressed, confused state. I'm sorry, I'm interjecting here. No, that was her saying, it's your fault I didn't do this sooner. If she'd kept talking, if she'd kept trying to convince her, if she kept telling her, she would have lost her friend. That's exactly right. Absolutely. The, mm -mm. Anyway. <sighs> it made me realize that as much as people are afraid to come across as offensive these days, perhaps what people really desire is to be offended to be offered truth and hope, anything other than the lies and ugliness that society is offering them. In general, women do not. They don't. They, they are so indoctrinated with, with the lies of feminism that if you try to convince them, they will be so defensive and go back to those same things about that's oppressive and he's controlling and all the rest of it. You can't, you can't convince them. You, you just can't. And if you keep trying, you will push them away. She was, she was right. I, I, I think she's right. Anything other than the lies and ugliness that society is offering them. I wish that were true. I wish that were true. If that were true, women would find this channel and they'd be like, oh my gosh, thank you. But they don't. I mean, I hope a few will, and then I hope that grows and grows and grows. I really do, but I don't know. So then Laura goes on to say, and so I write this. I hope, if anything, this may have been an encouragement. One, to stay-at-home mothers who feel their roles are insignificant due to what is loudly praised and ridiculed in society. Two, to everyone to not believe what self-love and self-care that self-love and self-care is the cure to your depression or any other problem you're facing, even though society insists it is, over, it is the overarching cure. To everyone again, to not be cowardly in standing up for what you believe in, especially those who have been made to believe that their traditional values must be hushed, lest they, God forbid, offend the victimized world. Women love your husbands respect him honor him submit to him don't try to dominate him have children if the lord grants you children and raise them up to have faith in christ and to cling to truth raising children and oops my pages are confused raising children and being there for your family is far greater is a far greater contribution to the world than you could give by toiling in the workforce. So true. Look at look at how society has it gotten better since women joined the workforce. No. Your professors in college will say, movies will say, but like for real, look around. Married women who aren't able to have children adopt. What a beautiful, beautiful gift you could give an orphan child who has a grim future. You can offer an unwanted child a loving home who would otherwise feel unloved, unimportant, and very likely lead a sad and hopeless life. You could teach this child of our God who is a father to them, a better father than any earthly father could ever be, and who loves them and values them and wants to bring them into his eternal loving home. This gift is priceless. Unmarried women. You can be, but don't have to be, an exception to avoiding the workforce. You are not yet married or committed to a husband and may need to provide for yourself if your father cannot. So if you must work, may it always be with the possibility in mind that the Lord will bring you a husband and your career will not come before him. And if you must work, it must be with the utmost care and respect toward the men you work with. 
I worked in restaurants before I met my husband, and sadly I saw married men, one after another, leave their families for the cute waitress who would flirt with and seduce them at work. Probably because their wives at home were nasty, weren't submitting to them, were argumentative, were not cooperative, were masculine, and always turned down their sexual advances when you shouldn't ever turn your husband down. So yeah, when somebody else seems sweet and gives you that female attention, yeah, look at, you're gonna. I mean, it's pretty difficult to resist. Men are not meant to go out into the day bonding with females for more hours a week than they spend with their own wives. This didn't used to be a common practice. It is a modern acceptance and it rarely ever turns out well as I have exemplified earlier. Yeah, she talked about in yesterday, in yesterday's, when I read the beginning of this article yesterday, she talked about uh, police officers being partnered up with women and what that led to. Women must be mindful of this and respectful, doing all things as unto the Lord and not for selfish gain. Further, single women can spend their time in noble pursuits, such as visiting orphans and widows and serving extended family and friends. There is a plethora of noble, God-honoring work to be done that single individuals are better capable of doing than families are due, are due to time and availability. The point is, giving of oneself for the betterment of another, ultimately for the kingdom of God, is what should be encouraged, admired, and sought after in society, not self-love, self-care, or the celebration of women empowerment. Yet sadly, we live in a backwards culture, and even reading such ideas is likely making the reader uncomfortable, if not appalled, if they've gotten this far. <laughs> I added the if they've gotten this far. <laughs> Now I must make clear that I hope not to have implied that I have mastered any of these qualities that I deem honorable. I certainly have not. I am naturally selfish just like everyone else. There is only one Jesus. The rest of us are inclined to selfishness. We surely then, and this is just is my whole point, do not need to be encouraged to be more selfish. I know, we do that enough on our own, please, especially women. God, we need to be encouraged to be selfless, just as all men are naturally prone to lust. They certainly do not need to be encouraged to lust or be told, it's okay, it's just who you are. They need to learn to control it and use it to benefit their relationship with their wives. Likewise, as women are prone to be overtaken by their strong emotions, they should not be encouraged to let their emotions dominate and rule over them. They need to learn to control their emotions, channel them in healthy ways, and make decisions and actions according to reason, not emotion. Oh my gosh, we need men's help with that so much, so much. We need our dads. To, oh my gosh, my dad helped with that so much. That's gonna be in one of my personal story videos that I share is kind of how I got here and how I got the way I was. And my dad was trying to teach me to regulate my emotions. Anyway, so it is with self-love. Lust is not a bad thing as long as it is directed properly towards one's spouse. Some people argue that lust is bad in general, but I don't agree. Lust is simply a strong sexual desire towards something, and it is good and right and normal to lust after your spouse. Most likely, if you're not lusting after your spouse, you'll be lusting after someone else, so better to channel it all on your spouse, which I highly recommend. But I digress. I agree with her. So too, emotions are not bad, as long as they are kept in check and used in positive ways. So self-love is not bad in and of itself, we indeed all have it, but left unchecked or overly emphasized, it could easily lead to, <laughs> to a narcissistic, aimless, dishonorable, and depressed society, which is what we have found ourselves in. How lost is this precious mind frame of J.R. Miller? Quote, love is always ready to deny itself, to give, sacrifice, just in the measure of its sincerity and intensity. Perfect love is perfect self-forgetfulness. Hence, 
Where there is love in a home, unselfishness is the law. Each forgets self and lives for others. But where there is selfishness, it mars joy. One selfish soul will destroy the sweetness of life in any home. It is like an ugly bush in the midst of a garden of flowers. It was selfishness that destroyed the first home and blighted all the loveliness of paradise. And it has been blighting lovely things in earth's home ever since. We need to guard against this spirit." End quote. Wow. Exactly. Yet how beautiful it would be to bring it back. I mean, I'm trying a little, a little bit. Another clarification I must make is that none of this is to say that I am not friends with anyone who disagrees with me. Quite the opposite. I have plenty of career women friends, working mom friends, and gay friends. I love them and they love me. Some think I'm silly for not working outside the home. Some agree with me and wish they could stay home with their children too. Ironically, all of my gay friends agree with me about the outrageous rainbow nonsense push in society. It's very possible to be friends with people you disagree with. Jesus was, you know, he didn't say, I'm going to pick, you know, the 12 best, you know, God-fearing, sinless people I can find to be my apostles. No, he was like, this is Matthew. He's a tax collector. You know, it, no, he, he, that's not who he picks. Sorry, I digress and I lost my spot for a second. Even more possible to love them, of course. And, and aren't we called to? Of course we are. But we are all entitled to my, an opinion. And it's sad when people with valuable opinions feel silenced in fear of offending the surrounding culture. It comes down to discernment. Don't be obnoxious, <laughs> but don't be a coward either. Quote, man has it all in his hands and he loses it all to sheer cowardice. That was Dostoevsky. I'm going to repeat that quote. Man has it all in his hands and he loses it all to sheer cowardice. Dostoevsky. Yeah. My dear friend whom I previously mentioned made this clear for me. And so I hope this has been an encouragement to the other side who gets shamed and ridiculed for not following the mindless spirit of the age wherever it blows. Lastly, I suppose all of this comes down to whether God is in the equation for you. Whether you aspire to, I mean, he's in the equation. It's whether you recognize it or not. Whether you aspire to live for the Lord or not. For if not, God's very word says then to, quote, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 32. In other words, go ahead and be selfish. You have no reason not to be. But if in fact Christ rose from the dead, we have all the reason to live honorable, worthy, sacrificial lives of love, humility, and grace. Is this, not a more, is this not a more beautiful way of living? Does this not give more worth and value to the girl who is told growing up that the most important thing about her is the career she will have? When in fact, the most important thing about us is what? I don't know where this page went. I think it's a typo. I think it's a typo. Again, there's several typos. That's why spell check was never a good thing. Because it doesn't catch everything. But who knows? Maybe I just live in an old world parallel, old world parallel universe that no one has a category for anymore. Which is probably true but it is all the more reason that I cling to dearly, that I cling so dearly to the scripture that reminds me that our home is not this world, 
but we are looking forward to a city whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11.10. So be it. Yet, in this self-destructive society drowning itself in the false promises of feminism and self-love, I contend there is a better way. And she shares these four scriptures at the end. Have this. Now, I usually do King James Version, but she had said what ESV, Standard Version, English Standard, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But keep that in mind. It's not King James. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the, to at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's not the head of the household. He's the head of the wife. He's the boss. Didn't mean to interrupt the Bible. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, the head of the church. His body is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything in everything to their husbands. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. And finally, teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Titus 2, 4 through 5. That is also the scripture that Lori Alexander often quotes because that is her mission now that she is a grandmother. She takes care of the grandbabies and her husband still, but she is teaching younger women. And I am one of those, even though I'm not young, like, boy, she's taught me a lot. And I've even reached out to her and, and times when I've had questions and, and she, she got back to me. This is before I started a YouTube channel to talk about this stuff. Um, but, you know, she, she's wonderful. And obviously, I, I would think that she's probably affected this lady and Lori Alexander is how I found Laura Dill's article here, and now it's a whole other wealth of, um, I don't say knowledge because God gives us all the knowledge. He already told us what to do, but I love the, um, the perspective and bringing today's society to it in a way that is, I think, I do think it's palatable to women, even if it's sort of like, you got to choke it down. I think that if you could get a woman to actually listen to what Laura is saying, especially yesterday's, the, the first part of this, I, I just don't see how you argue with it without actually sounding ridiculously selfish. And at the end of the day, you still 
they don't win that argument because the feminists, the working women, whatever, they don't win that argument because you don't get anything for yourself. That's the crazy irony is like all this selfishness, self-love, self-care, da 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 da, self-esteem, chasing all that, all it has done is lead to a generations that are on antidepressants and drink wine by the box and get divorced and are unhappy all the rest of it like it's not helped anything and we can call it mental illness all day long but i mean i suppose they have to come up with other words that that isn't like well they don't have god right well god's order was completely in disarray in their nuclear family growing up they have no concept of it and you end up with narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder and you know people getting diagnosed as bipolar it's like well is it or do you not know how to regulate your emotions because you've never been taught i don't know but i know that it's interesting that you remove god and you get mental illness and i think it's a way again it's another way to say oh i don't have to be accountable it's an illness like, all right, and they still think you need to be accountable. I don't know. Maybe it's because I was raised in a family where it was like, you, you don't make excuses, and you're gonna you're gonna be in trouble regardless of what your reasons and excuses and everything are. And I mean, I'm glad about that. So, thank you guys for all of the wonderful comments, and I just am so excited at how well received it is when I talk about, you know, biblical truth with you guys and biblical womanhood and God's natural order. And she's right. I mean, I've been like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to push people away from God. But then at the same time, I'm like, I'm not a preacher. That's not what I'm here for. If God chooses to use this to witness to people, I will be the vessel happily. But I cannot ignore where, where things went wrong and they went wrong when we stopped acknowledging female nature and just let Eve go walk about so that, you know, no one was there to be like, hey, don't talk to that serpent. He's lying to you. Shut up, serpent. Go away. And Adam's like, he listened to her. And, and, and it's just been kind of like the same dynamic ever since. And right now, it's, it seems like very clear to me that it is the same dynamic, but on a giant macro level. So clearly, there's a lot of you guys out there that, that think the same thing. Please like this video. Please subscribe to the channel. And please share this. Share it where you think it will be helpful where where women who might this might strike a chord with might see it there's a lot of women in the church that need this message there's so many career women in the church it's ridiculous but of course there are the churches are hacks exempt which to me is like code for they take a bribe from the government so are they going to say, don't put your kids in school? You should teach them. Don't send them to those godless institutions. Wives, stay home. You need to be at home. You need to submit to your husband. They don't say any of that. It's a little bit like, hmm. It's kind of in lockstep with what's best for like things that would benefit the government. Weird coincidence. Just saying. So I think we, we might step into a little bit of politics, so to speak, as it goes to that. I'm not talking about who you vote for, who you don't vote for, are you Democrat or you Republican or whatever. We're not getting into that. I don't, I, don't, I don't need a king. I have a king. I don't need, there's, there's no law that exists. There's no man's law that exists that God hasn't covered. It's just 
extra stuff that they that governments do to increase their power and somewhere around the mid 20th century people as uh oh my gosh i'm gonna forget the guy's name oh my gosh oh he's a radio he's a famous radio guy back when radio was good he it's on the tip of my tongue you guys know you guys know me by now you know i forget these names and stuff as soon as i need to remember them when i'm talking to you and anyway he did this whole speech of what he would do if he was satan in america and how he would uh what he would do if he wanted to you know satan was gonna take over america and one of the things he said was i would i'm totally botching it but he would say i would change it to our father who art in washington and you know when that happened around world war ii and you know the kids who were born boomers and you know the children of the boomers are the gen x kids and the millennial kids and we are godless shocking but we sure do love our government you know and that's when i think the old switcheroo took place anyway i kind of start digressing but it's it's fascinating to me i think it all plays a part and i have a feeling a lot of you guys do too so if you've made it this far um tell me what you think about that i mean tell me what you think about the conclusion of this article and what she has to say and but then also tell me if you think the politics, so to speak, has played a part in this as well. Because government has an interest in removing God. And when I saw that it's no longer Anno Domini and before Christ, I'm like, um, okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you guys for hanging out and talking about this stuff. I'm very passionate about it, and I'm excited that you guys seem to be too. I want you guys to take care of yourselves, and I know there's a white pill. There is a white pill. There is a white pill. Okay? And we're going to get there. We're going to get there somehow. But here lies the truth. So take care of yourselves, and I will see you guys on the next